Today, we're going to talk about best practices for designing and maintaining functional athletic fields. Um, during the webinar, should you have any questions at all, go ahead and enter those questions into the GoToWebinar control panel on the side of your um, dashboard there. Um, we are recording this session, so afterwards, uh, we'll be sending a link to the recording later today. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to first introduce um, our host here today. We have Chris Wright, who's the VP of Sales of Baseline Irrigation as part of the Smart Irrigation System from HydroPoint. And then we have Andy Humphrey, uh, Regional Manager of the Northeast at Baseline as well. So thank you, too. I'll just go ahead and hand it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Meg. Appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. We're very excited to uh, uh, present the second uh, webinar as a HydroPoint Thought Leadership um, presentation focused on baseline solutions or baseline systems as a smart water solution under the HydroPoint brand. And we're excited to have uh, some experts uh, join us today in discussing uh, proper application of irrigation and best management practices for uh, sports turf and um, sports uh, turf maintenance. So joining me, I've got Andy Humphrey uh, from Baseline, who is the regional manager in the Northeast. Um, and then our special guests are uh, from Pacific Sports Turf Management, Jim White, who is the irrigation manager, and Damon Richards, Richardson as the field tech consultant for a very prominent uh, sports turf management company uh, headquartered in uh, Portland, Oregon area. So welcome, you guys. We're excited to have you join us today, and uh, we're excited to hear the uh, uh, discussion and the content that you have to share um, for the proper design and maintenance of uh, sports turf irrigation systems and sports turf in general. So welcome, appreciate you joining us. So let's get uh, started. Um, let's have uh, first Damon, if you would give us a uh, uh, background about Pacific sports turf irrigation um, and a little bit about your background and then we'll do the same with Jim. Well. Uh... Pacific Source Turf, we started uh, back in 2000 um, in December, uh, actually December 99, uh, after an uh, acquisition from True Green Land Care. Uh, so we went out on our own and started the company with the owner, Dick Fluter, and the vice president, uh, TJ Worth. Uh, I've been with the company since 99 um, and working along with Dick, and it's been uh, a pleasure. I've learned a ton from them, uh, and they they thrust me into the irrigation realm early in my career, uh, somewhere like early 2002 ish, and I took off from there with you know control systems, uh, starting out with um, a couple of baseline competitors, and then starting to get into baseline a little bit uh, once we had brought Jim on here about uh, five years ago, I think. Five years. Um, yep. So uh, I do many different things for PST right now and you know Jim's our irrigation uh, manager and runs that division so thanks for excellent me. so Jim I know you've got a, a rich background in uh, irrigation best practices and and conservation um, how did you come to sports turf Pacific sports turf and and what's your role there well, I'd, uh, we moved up to Portland, Oregon in 2005, and prior to that, I was in uh, the desert southwest and uh, uh, been working in irrigation systems down there for the last 30 years plus. So, as you might imagine, it's a it's a uh, it's a challenging uh, high desert situation down there with uh, highs in the hundreds and plus and freezing every winter down to 20 degrees or less. So it's the it's the worst possible uh, spot for horticulture and, <laughs> and irrigation is a challenge down there, but, uh, yeah. and limited water supplies, obviously. So, uh, you know, 15 years ago, we decided to move up here where water supplies are a little more plentiful and little did I realize that, uh, there's a, a summer drought in this area and irrigation is uh, an important aspect. So, yeah. Very true. Yes. And we realized that, uh, you know, the information that we're sharing today is, 
uh, primarily focused on uh, the practices in the Northwest because of uh, your locale and your experience. Um, but we feel that there are many common uh, principles that are nationwide um, when managing sports turf. And there's you know a number of challenges that come with that. So let's uh, let's start first by talking about some of these challenges that you face when you're maintaining sports fields. Um, I know there's several topics that may be included in that. Um, so what's a primary one that you deal with, Damon? Well, uh, some of our, our bigger challenges in maintaining are actually taking the, the projects over after construction. And, you know, m many times there's, you know, some minor tweaks that could be made in some of the inputs in the soils or the soil types. Uh, grade tolerances, um, grow in the establishment, and you know, many times it seems like we take over a little bit behind the game, um, where a landscaper may have kind of starved that turf plant uh, to death, and then just shot it with some ammonium sulfate or something to green it up to hand it over to the client and get passed, and then we're struggling trying to fix you know pH values and nutrient stuff, decompaction, and you know fixing wet areas that might have some settling from grade tolerances where you're plus or minus a tenth of a foot that's it's a lot of standing water on a, a minimum slope so yeah, those, those pictures speak volumes <laughs> yeah yeah and it's it's unfortunate because you know it's it's little tiny tweaks that can make huge huge difference um it usually adds a little bit of cost but it's you know it's worthwhile for the client in the end to have that just because it makes it easier for them to have a successful field after that. This is my opinion, a lot of the reasons why things kind of go to synthetic is they they think they get top notch when they're handed over. It's not really, and it fails, so they throw plastic in. Interesting. Yep. And these challenges, you know, poor poor soil structure, grade tolerances, and irrigation and drainage, regardless of where you are in the country, you could oh, yeah. be with those uh, same uh, challenges when when maintaining the turf quality for sure the, the yeah concept. and Damon real quick about how long after installation typically is it before you guys take over on the maintenance you know it kind of varies I mean sometimes it's you know almost immediately after a grow in um, sometimes it'll be you know a year or two later where they just you know the 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 clients throwing their hands up and they just need it fixed and they call us and ask us what goes on and we have to go you know do some testing and, and come up with a plan but uh i i'd say you know half the time it seems about a year or two after uh prominence and if it's outside the metro area it might take a little bit longer than that to where they they, they catch wind of us somewhere and uh, we'll go down and try to figure out how to help them out very cool. So as we look at those challenges, you know, we got to backtrack to the original design, right? Yeah, you know, yeah it's, I mean, it's, it, that's the bones of it. If it's not put together right and then not implemented well, um, little tiny things turn into huge, huge issues later. Uh, we don't want to strive for absolute per perfection, obviously, but it's it's something we should try to do to to make sure that things are successful in the end. Okay. Excellent. So a lot of these challenges are irrigation related, um, mm -hmm. Jim. So from your perspective, you know, what does an ideal sports field irrigation design look like? What kind of features do you like designed in that helps you to manage and maintain the irrigation system long term? Well, sure. So, uh, I mean, we can go right to the basics of an irrigation system that's it, that uh, are basically the same as you would have with any irrigation with uh, good head-to-head -head coverage and good pressure and right nozzle selection. All that applies for sports uh, fields as well. Uh, some of the differences, though, would be uh, the, the sport itself and how that differs between uh, a football field versus a soccer field versus a, a baseball field and all different requirements and uh, different seasons, frankly. So some, some of these are in winter seasons where up in this neighborhood, we have uh, you know, plenty of rainfall and that, that, that affects. Uh, their, uh, baseball, for example, their, their spring, spring ball and fall ball. 
and that gets right into our shoulders here where we may or may not have uh, rainfall and then there's irrigation involved. So, and, and beyond that, um, some of the basic uh, principles of zoning and where where the heavy use areas are on a particular sports field. All right, so let's let's look at a football field first. We've got uh, an irrigation design or diagram of a, a football irrigation plan. What yeah. what do you look for in that? So if you, if you look at that, those are uh, basically in the center. There's uh, six different uh, zones, and they're running down the length of the field, uh, as opposed to many football designs that we see that are what they call the block uh, zoning which which doesn't really take into effect where the heavy use is which is right down the center of a football field and so if we're trying to maintain a football field uh, uh, try, trying to uh, uh, bring back the heavy use areas with uh, getting some more seed going or something this this allows us to tailor the irrigation uh, for a grow in in just the centers as as opposed to a block pattern where we would have to basically irrigate the entire field just to bring back the centers. Interesting. Yep. So would that pipe layout or design differ on, say, a soccer pitch? Well, it uh, it could a little bit. Uh, soccer, for example, their heavy use area is right at the goal mounds. And so you'll want you'll want something that uh, where your zones are set, uh, centered there apart from um, well, say we're showing a, a double uh, soccer field layout right here, but uh, you, you basically just want to be able to zone uh, to account for the heavy use areas. Th this is an example of an, an extreme uh, version of this where basically every one of those uh, two head uh, layouts there are individual zones. So th this, this was a soccer field uh, that has two soccer uh, fields that had 10 zones to start with and we redesigned that with over 30 zones to it to give us that precise res resolution to water where we need to water brilliant and it, and it looks like in this case when you talk about the heavy usage that's right in the the center of the field and so the zones here just like the other um the football field where the pipes were running the other direction it was still controlling the zone at the center of the field where this is doing the same thing. There's just two heads in the center of the field here being controlled, even though the pipes are running in a different Correct. direction. Correct. I mean, every every zone basically has two heads on it. It just gives us a, a, a very precise resolution and ability to turn something on and others uh, less less frequently. Okay. And mm -hmm. then on a on a baseball field, the holy grail of the baseball field is the infield, correct? It is the infield, correct. And um, this this was a field that uh, that we rebuilt the irrigation on last year, and uh, you know primarily our work was out into the outfield, as you can see out there from this uh, aerial. Uh, aerials are great for showing up poor irrigation systems. Yeah, you can, <laughs> get the donuts. You can see the, the the dry spots in the aerial, obviously. Yeah. So that we corrected that with this. Uh, in this case, we left the infield as it was. We we uh, uh, upgraded the sprinkler heads themselves on it, and upgraded the pipe size so we got the correct pressure going out to the infield. But uh, yeah, the the infield, like you say, is the it's it's what the coaches focus on. Uh, and, Very uh, good. And that gets more into the how does the how does irrigation technology play a role in these designs and and long term maintenance of sports fields? What are some of the things that you look for in irrigation well, technology? Well, for one thing, uh, uh, going going back to that soccer field, you know, uh, back in the past, uh, most controllers had three or four programs available, and that would be unmanageable on a on a on a pitch like that layout was. So we're, we're using a little more state-of-the-art controllers that uh, I, I have I have uh, 12 programs that are running that one field out there on a, on a regular basis. We separate uh, the, the full circles from the part circles and the, and the, the corner heads are on a program by themselves, you know, that, that type of resolution. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's 12 programs for one field, you know, one. so if you had a complex that had five fields, you know, that could be potentially 60 programs. Correct. 
Right, and there's very few controllers that will accommodate that. Yeah, well, we appreciate your advocacy of uh, baseline products for a number of years, and and know that you you utilize many of the programs available on a baseline 3200 for that. Yeah, so. people wonder why there's 99 programs available. This is exactly why. Wow. Exactly. Yes. So another challenge that I'm sure you face is in maintaining the field is in the uh, scheduling on heavily used fields, correct? Yeah, scheduling is, a, is definitely another challenge because of the usage on a field. And uh, here, here we're showing a shot where we're trying to uh, uh, aerate a field and we, we cannot convince the, the clubs to get out of the way of the tractor. So it's mm -hmm. a, so somewhat of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, we're, right yet, though. we're good. Yeah. Excellent. Don't you turn right. on the sprinklers to get them off the field? Isn't that the best way? We have, we have been known to do that, yes. <laughs> you do that for the geese, not the players. <laughs> that works for geese too, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, so we've talked a couple about a couple of, uh, you know, principles for uh, design of uh, different sports turf. Now let's move to maintenance. And that's where you um, and Pacific Sports Turf really excel and shine. So um, what are some of the best management practices for sports turf? What do you look for? Are there, you know, key things that that lay a foundation for that maintenance? Yeah, we really kind of hammer on the consistent mowing, uh, proper irrigation, and, and a really good nutrient program. That you know, nutrient program isn't just fertilizer. It's you know, checking your biology, making sure that you've got good biology, good pH values, uh, the right amount of magnesium, calcium ratios. And, and a, a good, good soil for your living turf to grow in. Um, and then we focus on irrigation, which is, you know, the utmost importance. As you can see in every overhead, you can see stressed out plants where the irrigation is either improperly installed or under pressured or not spaced right. And mowing is also important uh, in just turf health you know we see a lot of infrequent mowing where they mow once a week in the middle of the summer where they're growing you know an inch inch and a half and just lopping it off and stressing the plants out so most of our clients we really push them to really make sure that those three things are up to par and then we come in with a lot more of the technical stuff like the aeration and the seeding and the top dressing you know, divot repairs and, you know, coral like phrase mowing, doing stuff like that. So everything that we would do enhances a properly maintained site, but if they're not properly maintaining them to begin with, a lot of the other stuff really doesn't have the effects that they would expect it to or that we would want it to. Um, yeah. So, in turn, you know, we don't, we, we apply nutrients when we have to. We obviously manage irrigation and are pretty proud of how we do that. Um, very proud of Jim and his team. And then, but mowing, we don't own mowers. We really try to get our clients to take the, the bull by the horn, so to speak, and, and make sure that those are done right, you know, two or three times a week if they can during the growing season at a minimum, uh, twice minimum during the growing season is what we really try to get on, on good fields. Um, yeah. So it seems like there's a fine balance between all of these different components that need to be managed uh, um, in, independent of each other, but also holistically to have a successful yeah. uh, plane surface, right? Right. I mean, the, the, the turf health is paramount. I mean, if we don't have good turf health, turf health, you know, our wear areas don't fill in as quickly. They don't take the wear the same. And if you look at a lot of universities, uh, OSU out here, Oregon State University, they, they call it the pillars or the stool. If, if one of those legs of uh, irrigation fertilization or mowing really falls off then you have a susceptible plant stand um, where you can get more disease you can get higher wear uh, lower recovery uh, it doesn't matter the grass plant or really the region that you're in you, you've got to focus on those fundamentals in order to have uh, a proper stand or a proper field yeah i've got a quick question yeah uh for, for jim you know as it relates to to water or or irrigation how do you you know as the irrigation uh manager decide when to water how long to water you know is there too much water is there not enough water can you kind of walk us through some of the 
either tools, technology, or or tips that you use? Oh, sure. So we we be, we use the basic tool of soil probes. We get out there uh, frequently and just uh, check moisture levels and uh, root depth. And then uh, there's a picture of the soil probes. Uh, yep. That's on a basic level. Uh, we're fortunate to be able to use some of the higher uh, level technology, uh, soil moisture sensors, which also give us temperature on top of that. And um, and we use some other uh, uh, handheld moisture sensors to, to uh, basically get that information. And then it, then it just goes right back to the basics. You know, what is what is the ET for the day? How much did we lose last night? How many minutes do we need to r run to replenish that the next day? And then uh, and then we dance around the mower schedule because it, uh, it, it's it's better if they're going to mow when the grass is a little uh, less wet. And so we we really try to accommodate that. It, it works better for everybody if they're mowing something that uh, that uh, is is a little drier rather than wet. So. Okay, that was going to be sort of my next sort of leading question is that as a manager, do you prefer it to be wetter, managed to the to the upper or managed to the drier? Uh, so on a sports field, uh, for playability, uh, you, you need that a little bit firm. So, uh, and if we know there's an event coming up, then you've got to, you've got to uh, slow down the irrigation a little bit. There's, not, there's nothing worse than the, the players on a, on a wet field because they'll tear it up. Yeah. Yeah, so it's got to be firm, but in a, a soccer application, for example, they like the field to be wet when they're playing on it, right? Because the ball rolls. That's interesting. The, 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 and I don't, uh, the, the ball rolls better if it's a little wet, but that's just the, the blades. That's not the soil. No, right. It, so that it, would be it, like a quick syringe sort of yeah. cycle just to wet it down. Which, yeah. which is what a couple of those programs, the 12 programs on that field, one's a, a, just a syringe cycle. Gotcha. So is this you, where we get to plug uh, baseline technology? <laughs> yeah. Where, how would you dial in where you would want to apply water on a field and where you wouldn't want to apply water on the field? What are some of the tools you use to do that? Uh, specifically, what do, you, what do you mean? So. Coaches. Well, if you're if you're trying to prepare a field for playability and you need to wet down part of it, what what do you use in order to do that? Oh well, so if we're talking soccer, uh, they they like it wet right at the goal mounds, and so if you if you've got your system zone, so that's that's two programs you can run real quickly and and uh, maybe maybe three zones on each program, and and typically a syringe cycle will run uh, one one turn of a head about three minutes. Yeah, it's a very short yeah. cycle. Is having a map interface to, you know, control from help in that process? You know, somewhere I think uh, there, there. We, this, so this is actually a, a, an interactive map-based system that we're using. Every one of these, uh, you know, we call these the bubbles. These the green bubbles out there. Those are uh, those are irrigation zones, and we can we can tap on one of those bubbles and and uh, run it for three minutes, and you know, we have the ability to run eight of those at the, at the same time, uh, you know, ba basically a, a 400 gallon a minute or so. So we can run quite a few of these con uh, concurrently out there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. knowing that site, I, I know that the hydraulic structure associated with it is uh, pretty complex with the uh, yeah. large main with sub mains and, you know, yeah, the ability apparently. to to manage flow the, that is that price. actually is the, oh, the is. largest uh, uh, benefit we have with that control system out there uh, we have uh, uh, four controllers that are running that particular one there's uh, roughly 25 points of connection uh, two two uh, large mainline feeds and uh, 20 some sub meters running that so the, we, we have a lot of resolution on what our flow values are and what our maximum flow capability is out there very cool awesome and then what uh jim what type of control do you like to give over to either the owner the user the coach do you give them sort of any control of the system well that that varies by the coach and the and the, the site you know we do a lot of uh school uh sports fields and, and parks sports fields and, and in that case they, they would have more access into the programming itself and mm -hmm. in other situations you know that's probably not the best idea to, to have them be able to adjust programs 
So, so there is a, a device called a coach's button, and we've we've used that where it's a it's a completely programmable button that uh, if that coach wants a 10 minute run, uh, he can just hit the button; it'll run for 10 minutes. So he doesn't have to get into the system and try to figure out how to, to set up a runtime. Right, like on that soccer example, that seems like a great way for them to syringe it very quickly without needing any knowledge or access to the controller. Just hit, uh, hit the red button. So, yeah. so, or they call us and say, would you please just turn this on? And, and uh, it, it could be a, a Sunday morning and we're out of town and we still have, because it's a web-based system, we can turn it on for them for 10 minutes. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let's see. Is Chris frozen for you guys or just for me? No, it looks like he's frozen for everybody. He's frozen. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he he just sent over. He lost some power. Oh, he lost some power. So um, this is actually perfect timing. Let's just kind of get to like some best practices. If you guys had to, you know, summarize, um, you know, some of your challenges, and then we talked through some solutions too. Um, just overall best practices for both um, designing and maintaining sports turf. Let's start with you, Damon. Okay, so I would, um, when it comes to the nutrient values, I, I would suggest that anybody who's managing or getting ready to work on a field or give input, uh, soil test, uh, get a, a chemical soil test of the soil, top three inches, you know, the working root zone to make sure you can put together a good nutrient program. And then again, follow the consistent mowing guidelines uh, and work with irrigation, which Jim can speak on. Um, those are fundamentally it has to be done and we see so many fields failing just because they're only going to fertilize their field uh, feed it twice a year instead of you know trying to keep that thing pushing and growing through the the season when they need it to so we can't stress it enough that those are the three most important things you could possibly do to have a successful property um, and then design one is yeah, I, we could get into a whole nother webinar about design and, and drainage and, and soil types and values and, you know, pre-construction stuff. So. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, just continuing to speak to water and irrigation, Jim, you know, when you guys take over fields, are there any common themes that you see that you wish the designers would do differently? In other words, maybe they're thinking they're not considering the end result in mind or the maintenance in mind. You know, are there, or I guess maybe, what do you have to change on these systems most? Well, it's not, it's not so much a change uh, unless it's a, a complete uh, retrofit of the existing design, which is which we have to do in some cases. But but it goes right back to what Damon was saying. We've been talking about this that that uh, you have to zone your irrigation system according to where the, the usage is on the field uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to a, a, a typical residential or, or commercial layout where you're basically just trying to set up a zone uh, that that covers an area that's more uh, focused on using the maximum capability of the of the pipe that you have available out there mm -hmm. uh, what's your what's your water flow and pressure available this this is a different way of doing it where you're trying to target uh, the heavy use areas on a field and and that's where your zoning has to come in and, and if, we, if we come onto a, a site that's not built that way from the get-go then uh, it's very hard to manage it correctly right and i could see that if it was just one let's say football field then it would be we could more easily understand where the use is going to be if it's a large you know say quad or intramural slash multi-purpose field it would, might be important to know where is that soccer field going to be in this open green area or where is that football field going to be or how are they going to be positioned so that you could zone it according to the future you know soccer layout and, and goals and such. The, the school sites that we get onto when they have mixed use so they'll, they'll have their uh, their baseball outfield also uh, doubles as a soccer field and and, uh, and that those are just different challenges. Yeah, so thinking about where that where that main use is, where the wear is going to be, where you're going to have to be overseeding and such, and repairing those those spots. And and on a design design standpoint, that just comes down to there's there's more valves, there's more there's more zones as opposed to less zones. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yep, which does increase the cost up front a little bit. But when you look at the 20 year maintenance on that system, I could see that, yeah, spending a little bit more on the irrigation to have that better resolution, as you mentioned before, could pay dividends in the long run. Yep, especially with water rates, uh, they're continuing to go up everywhere, even here. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that goes on with the pipe sizing too. So, you know, not trying to save money on the pipe size by breaking stuff up, but you know, we put a lot of three and four inch laterals in because they have to go a long ways with a lot of volume. Um, and it, it does cost more, right, Jim? It just, it does, it's a lot more plastic, but in the long run, the, the users are far happier when they're stuck trying to fix that field three or four years down the road. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you know, technology changes. So the types of irrigation systems that we have today, you know, are yeah. not the same that we had five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so, systems of the past you may have only been able to run one zone maybe two zones at a time and so you would zone it much bigger right and now you know i like how you mentioned jim that tighter resolution so if you're putting two heads on a zone maybe you want to run as you said eight at a time right and historically that's been a lot more difficult to try to manage with a control system where today you know, just to hear plug baseline, right? That's why we're here. We can run up to 15 at a time and the controllers today are smart enough to help and assist with, with that. So you can have that tight resolution and have different zones coming on all concurrently. Absolutely. It, uh, it almost mirrors a, 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 a valve and head type setup like you can see on a golf course. Yeah, and you know, who knows what the next five years will bring. Maybe we'll be going right back to that. <laughs> Love it. Well, this is a, a great segue over to um, our question and answer session. Um, we already have a couple questions that did come in, but just a reminder to those in the audience um, and put in any questions you have for us in the questions section there. Um, we have gotten a couple questions and comments already about Chris Wright's beard. So unfortunately, he is not here. He got disconnected. He lost power. <laughs> But several, several comments about how lush and large his beard is. So we'll have to, you know, pass that on to Chris as he gets his power again. That um, is so truly Chris. the way to his heart, whoever is mentioning <laughs> and asking. Yeah. <laughs> right. Awesome. So thank you all for your comments about Chris's beard. Um, so I'm just going to kind of run through some of these questions that have come in. Feel free to keep, keep them coming. Um, the first question is, do you have a preference of valve in head versus rotors? Hold on, let me say that again. Do you have a preference of valve in head versus rotors and valves? Does that make sense? Perfect, Jim. We were just sort of talking about that. So why don't we just, why don't you just continue? Yeah. Well, so uh, obviously a valve, valve and head you, you see on golf courses, uh, they're, they're much more expensive. Uh, they, they have typically higher demands for pressure and flow. And uh, we, we actually contemplated using some of those in uh, on that double pitch uh, design that we had there. But uh, essentially, you've got to run uh, wire out to every one of those. So uh, we, we we elected not to do that on that particular site. The and size that, of them. Yeah. And 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 the, the the footprint of a, a valve and head is large, and it, pre, it presents more of a a, a hazard on some fields. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we have, I'll add one comment from the sort of us as the manufacturer side, we have seen, you know, many sites that choose valve and head. And with the decoder technology, some of the valve and head sprinklers have a large enough um, cavity, if you will, to put the decoder right inside um, the sprinkler. So that it, like, like you mentioned, Jim, you have to run a wire. So if you run two wire, you can put the decoder actually inside the sprinkler. Okay. And if you guys come up with a wireless decoder, that would be great. Noted. <laughs> awesome. So next question is from Jason. It says, any ideas for best practice irrigation layout for baseball infields? Some pros and cons. <laughs> I'll let you go with that one, Jim. <laughs> I, I was hoping you were going to cover that one. <laughs> There's what, no what was question again? Just any ideas for best practices for irrigation layouts for baseball infields? Well, so the, the typical layout is uh, uh, four heads basically on, on the edges. 
Uh, it's not it's not the perfect layout. We have uh, experimented with some smaller heads, uh, getting a little more coverage, but you know it's, uh, it's it's the same issue. You've got more infrastructure out there in a in a heavily used area, and it's probably not the best plan to do that. So so we're, we're typically running you know just four heads out on the edges. An and that what you mean by that, Jim, is they're not in the corners as is more typical with irrigation designs by right putting your heads in the corners. You're saying you're putting them halfway between home plate and first base and first base and second right. base. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The lines. Yeah. The eyebrows are always an issue and there's nothing that we'll ever be able to do about it. And it's frustrating as I'll get out. Hmm. Awesome. Next question is from Ron. Is irrigating artificial turf recommended and why? Well, I wouldn't call it irrigation. So the, in, in that the, uh, previous life in the desert, uh, the, the, there was a lot of synthetic that was going in and uh, the, the, the playability in the summer was not practical as it was getting to 150, 160 degrees. And so they, they had to put irrigation in just to cool it down and not uh, burn skin. So it's not necessarily, it's a, it's more of a wet down application. Yeah. And it, they sense. also use it to wash through because there's no biology in synthetic. So we've heard a lot of people using irrigation to wash fluids through, uh, if you know what I mean, uh, especially football fields and, you know, things happen out there. So yep. if there's no biology to eat it up. They, they got to try to wash it through the system um, and they use it, but if they're going to have irrigation in a synthetic field, they, they best make sure they put that infrastructure in uh, at the base because it's awful hard to go back after. Yeah. yeah. And we've seen um special use case for field hockey fields, which isn't real. It's more of an astroturf than it is the um, synthetic field. And it's actually sort of a regulation. There's an international field hockey federation of sorts that sort of regulates um, how much water to put down because it affects that playability of the ball so we've actually seen quite a few field hockey um, facilities go in that specifically put in the coach's button so the coach can hit it and it puts down exactly the right amount of water uh, for that playability that's great uh, next question questions from lou what's your point of view on the use of fertigation systems that, that's a that's a really good question so uh Fertigation basically is you're, you're putting fertilizer uh, into the water feed going in and distributing it through your sprinklers. And so the, the, the number one concern is how, how good is your uh, irrigation coverage? Uh, in, in, in our world, we call that a distribution uniformity. How, how evenly does that water cover every square inch out there? Because you're at, and, and now because you're going to put fertilizer down, and if uh, so a, a typical uh, irrigation system in a good form is a 70 percent uniformity so if you're going to put fertilizer down there's 30 percent that may or may not be getting the fertilizer you want so it's just a it's a it's an issue it's a it's used in agriculture a lot and not so much in our side of it so, got it great yeah, um uh, next good system to do that Okay, next question is from Roger. Um, this is more for Jim. Jim, have you tried rotary nozzles in baseball infields? Uh, I, I have put several designs together for that, but still we're running into uh, smaller, uh, smaller and more, um, more, more heads in an infield. And that's what we're trying to avoid. The, the problem, with that is when we're trying to maintain it, we still should be aerating, um, you know, slice eating, top dressing, and you you can't do that on a head. So you got to pick up over the top of it or try to avoid it somehow. So the more heads we have in an area, the harder it is to do the other cultural practices that could be necessary to keep that field going good. Um, there's a happy medium. And what would you say, Jim? Like that 35 ish foot mark is about tops where it really starts to get difficult for operators to work around those heads well yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we, we try to keep it at like you know 40 to 60 feet is generally what we space at right yep 
So it's, it's a challenge, and that's why the, the coaches will step in and they'll they'll supplement irrigation. Uh, you know, most of the fields will have a, a quick coupler right behind the batters, uh, uh, the pitcher's mound, so they can supplement with their own irrigation. So let's just great. We got lots more questions coming, so I'm just gonna shoot and fire for them for you. Um, so next one is: Do you have any thought on water retention pods or cisterns? For sports ah, I like this. Damon gets excited. <laughs> I, I love the concept because we, we lose a lot of water, but they're really difficult. We we tried to work with a client here a couple of years ago about using some giant ponds they had uh, for their site water. I, I forget the exact reason that it came down to, but we had issues with it was the EPA or one of the water rights agencies that they had to have a special filtration system to actually use that water out of the pond um, because it was stormwater runoff from the parking lots and they look at that sometimes as hazardous waste being thrown back out on the fields so they they've got different stipulations and i don't know if some of it's overreacting or not uh, the concept is awesome we do have several clients that have cisterns that will help supplement um, jim was actually just working with one using a baseline system here last winter and we just finally got the thing tuned up and i think operable really good right now and that's using cooling water off of their towers for their hvac system uh, the condensation that re is recovered from that along with some like roof stormwater runoff but they have to be big tanks and most yeah. likely gonna have to be supplemented because you're not going to have enough water to um keep you through the summer with a cistern got it Next question from Steve. Do you ever use sub drip on perimeter to keep brick dust areas dry and the and place rotors or pop-ups to water larger areas? Well, that's another interesting question. So uh, the, the, the subsurface drip irrigation in, in turf is a challenge. And it, it can be done. Uh, there's, uh, I've seen many examples. We've installed uh, not up in the northwest, but in the southwest. Uh, it's more popular down there, but uh, the the maintenance is tremendous. So, so it, it's certainly possible. But uh, uh, drip drip systems being what they are, and emitters being what they are, it's a it's a continual challenge. So. Got it. Okay, so we still have more questions coming, keep them coming, but I am just going to finish up um, just with one question to live. The rest of the questions will get to you. We'll follow up with you via email or phone call afterwards. So final question of the day, um, it's a good one, is from Jeff. Uh, they're presently designing a large sports complex. It's possible that in the future the water source will change from potable to reclaimed water. Other than filters, what challenges should we be anticipating as designers to prepare for that? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is a control system that has the ability to go uh, from one water source to another, on, uh, either on a manual basis or an automatic basis. And uh, a baseline there again is one of those few control systems that has that capability that the, you, you can uh, go up to a, a, on, on one controller a maximum of eight different uh, water sources which you know, there's not many other controllers in the world that will do that. And on the reclaim side, uh, if there's an intent to go there in the future, it might not be a bad idea to make sure that you use the, the correct reclaim uh, piping and valving, the, the, the heads, they, they've all got color codes to them. Uh, and if we're gonna be reclaimed in the future and we're more than 50% that it's going that way, um, I can see some regulation that you would hit if you weren't uh, color coded the way you're supposed to be. They, am I right in that, Jim? They have different colored pipe for that. I know that we have different tops for the heads. The valve boxes need to be like a special pink. Um, yep. and if not, we, they can have some regulation issues. Basically, the uh, the purple pipe for non-potable applications. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, thank you both for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, Andy, Jim, Damon, um, any last minute words, any tips, tricks, anything else you want to say before I wrap things up? Uh, thanks for having us and feel free to reach out with any questions.
Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for having for joining us today. Um, here is just some information. If you have any questions about uh, baseline irrigation solutions, the website, email address, and same thing for Pacific Sports Turf contact information website. We're going to follow up with all of you that asked any additional questions. Sorry, we didn't get to you. Um, great questions. We'll follow up with you after the webinar. We'll also send out a link to the recording later today. So thank you mm -hmm. all for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thanks, guys. See you, everyone. Thank you.